Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, folks, for uh, joining uh, this overall um, community gathering uh, and for joining the sessions later. Uh, for folks that are just tuning in, uh, there will be sessions uh, broken up, four different sessions actually, for the different types of, of uh, installations basically that you can do. So what I'm going to be providing uh, right now is just a quick walkthrough of a installation on vSphere with user provisioned infrastructure. And what does that mean? Well, so user provisioned infrastructure means that um, instead of the installer uh, configuring a load balancer within vSphere uh, or uh, configuring the IP numbers or any of that, uh, that this is all done with infrastructure that the user provides on the outside before they run the installer. And so the prerequisites for that uh, are basically handling DNS, DHCP, load balancer, and optionally a proxy. Uh, and Joseph is going to get more into the details of, of doing these specific things. But in short, uh, you're going to need uh, some DNS entries for uh, the bootstrap machine. You're going to need uh, three entries for your master nodes. Uh, OpenShift clusters uh, right now support uh, three uh, master nodes in the control plane, as it's called. Uh, and then you're going to need an entry for each of the desired workers uh, and also an entry for your endpoint and for your, uh, your API endpoint and your API internal endpoint that the nodes use to connect to each other. And then a wildcard entry, a wildcard DNS entry uh, of the form uh, like this, uh, so that once you've deployed apps on there, uh, by default, they would have the app name dot apps dot cluster name at your domain. And um, to give you an, an example of uh, that, so um, for user prov provisioned infrastructure on my end, um, I'm utilizing um, the uh, DNS uh, that is provided at the University of Michigan, which is a system called BlueCat, uh, running on Proteus. Uh, and so this is um, a way of um, very easily uh, configuring DNS uh, and DHCP. And so you can see for my demonstration cluster that you'll see more of in, in the session that I'm doing, um, uh, basically you can set up your DNS and this is what it would look like, right? So you've got your masters uh, and your worker nodes uh, at set IPs. And uh, GCP, um, I didn't fill in, fill in the details there. This is something that um, you'll want to do uh, in most cases. So the way OpenShift clusters work, you can do static IPs or you can do DHCP, uh, but you cannot do both. Uh, and this is, um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, basically um, when you have uh, chosen to go one route, you can't go back to the other. So if you're gonna do static IPs, you can do that by setting some kernel pr parameters with something called afterburn. Uh, and this is something that you pass to in the configuration of your nodes. Um, you pass a string, a configuration string that's handed to the kernel with your static IP. Um, or you can uh, rely on just the DHCP on your network and any address that's handed out. Um, alternately, uh, I took a third path, and I'll get into more details in my session, um, of using reserved DHCP and setting the MAC addresses on the nodes. And there's some advantages to that for UPI that I'll talk about. And um, you're also going to need a load balancer. Uh, outside so that uh, incoming requests to the API and the ingress uh, get passed to the um, respective machines, right? So uh, in terms of a um, load balancing, we've got a load balancing proxy, proxy uh, that uh, is called a um, big IP from F5 networks. Uh, and so uh, in my configuration, I use a big IP, which allows you to define pools of machines. Uh, so here you can see uh, this is the uh, API pool, uh, and this is the worker pool. And so this will load balance requests to their respective pools. 
And uh, there's also some, uh, one thing you don't see here, but I'll be showing in more detail is you can also do some checks. So for those of you that are familiar with the internals of Kubernetes, you know that there are health Z and um, ready Z uh, rest calls that you can make to get the status of, um, of your uh, cluster of your nodes in your cluster and uh in the f5 you can actually define those types of checks as well so be performing those checks externally an advantage of this is that if you uh if your entire cluster goes down and, and the internal notifications aren't working you have a, an external source of notification and monitoring uh to see that and i'll get into more details of that in, in the other session uh, another thing that you would need is a proxy if you're going to be on a private network. So this is something that um, OpenShift has been growing into when it was originally uh, in versions three, I should say, um, and less, there wasn't as much focus or support for um, private networks. And that's been increasing. But if you're going to be doing uh, a private network, you will need a load balancer for, uh, or a proxy uh, for your uh, calls out of your containers uh, once you have your cluster up, but also for the installation process as well, pulling down those containers that are part of the installation process. So uh, in terms of a proxy, um, you can use Squid. Uh, Squid is a, a freely available um, proxy that is very easy to set up and, and has a simple configuration file. Uh, and I'll be providing some examples of that uh, in the session that I have. And uh, if you look at uh, the documentation on the OKD website, uh, there is a link to uh, installing and then subsections. And so here is the section uh, installing on vSphere. And then there's uh, in another subsection under that, uh, installing on vSphere with user provisioned infrastructure. And that is, um, uh, what I've been working with. Uh, and this um, has a lot of great information. Um, I would encourage folks when they're trying um, either using the standard install or the user provisioned install functionality, either one, check out the UPI documentation for the platform that you're using. The reason that I suggest that is the UPI documentation shows you some of the things that are needed and some of the underlying details of a OpenShift install. And it can be really helpful for understanding overall how the process works. Um, and it's sectionized um, quite well uh, and shows you what you'll need in terms of your nodes and um, about creating the user provisioned infrastructure and uh, ports that you'll need and whatnot. So definitely check this um, documentation out. And one of the things that they've done is they've broken it out into um, several sections with the more levels of detail that you want to control, the higher resolution of detail that you want to control in your install. So there's a section installing a cluster on vSphere with user provisioned infrastructure and network customizations. And so that one, for example, uh, will provide you details uh, about setting static IPs and disk partitioning and some of the other stuff um, uh, that is uh, um, more um, a higher resolution of, of manipulation uh, of the install process. And uh, the install uh, usually takes about, um, uh, about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, and in the session that I'm doing, I'll be talking about how you can automate that process, uh, literally to be able to just run a script and configure, um, generate the necessary install files and whatnot, uh, and load those uh, into newly created VMs, uh, and then kick off the OpenShift installer so that you, you get uh, a um, very near to um, non-UPI installation experience and actually some extras. Let me bounce over here to, to provide a, an overview of some of the files that are involved in a UPI installation. So what you'll see is um, 
uh, after you've generated what are called ignition config files, um, you'll see uh, uh, a bootstrap ignition config. And ignition is the um, uh, basically the uh, metadata that's used that you put into the metadata of the node uh, to tell it to connect to the bootstrap server, or in the case of workers, to connect to the control plane to download the necessary components to join the cluster. And so you'll see multiple ignition configs for the bootstrap, for the master, for the worker. Uh, after you've run the installation, there are some hidden files, uh, an install log and a state file that, that says the state of the cluster. Now there's one thing that I want to point out um, for UPI installations that is true across the board. Um, uh, and it's something that sometimes surprises folks is that the installation, the OpenShift install binary um, actually ingests and deletes um, your install config. So you'll have like a general install config that you'll um, configure the parameters for, for your cluster. Uh, and they reference that um, in the documentation, what you need uh, to have in that. One thing that happens though, is when you run the installer, uh, it actually eats that file up. So you'll want to always make a backup of it. Um, I'm trying to find an example of it here. You'll always want to make a, here we go. You'll always want to make a backup of it uh, so that you can control, uh, or so that you can duplicate uh, the process uh, again without having to do a lot of work. Uh, and the tool that I'll be demonstrating that I wrote uh, actually allows you to, to have a template and then it, it duplicates that template and then goes from there so that you don't have to do anything uh, by hand. And that is the overall process of uh, installing with vSphere. Um, basically, you generate your files uh, and um, uh, you deploy your infrastructure, uh, you generate your files, uh, and uh, then you create the nodes with the metadata from those ignition config files, and then you run the installer. So that's a general overview. And uh, again, if you want more specifics of that and you want to see an automated example of that, then uh, please uh, check out uh, the session uh, that I'll be hosting with Joseph. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing myself uh, and then we'll move on.